September 10, 2001, one block from the World Trade Center, security cameras captured the last known images of Dr. Sneha Ann Phillip shopping. At 7.18 p.m., she swipes a credit card, grabs her bags, and exits onto the street, into the rain. She never comes home. The next day, we just had a, a plane crash into level four of the World Trade Center. Chaos. Thousands disappear. But Sneha is different. There is not a trace of her. Nothing. Listen to Missing on 9-11 on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. From iHeartRadio, The Don, the definitive 24-episode podcast series on the producer of Flashdance, Beverly Hills Cop, and Top Gun, the maverick, Don Simpson. Don lived for the movies, and tragically, he died for them. The LA coroner proclaimed Don's body to be the most toxic corpse in the history of California autopsy. Season one takes you inside the nefarious circumstances surrounding Don's death. Listen to The Don on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Paper Ghosts is a production of iHeartRadio. My search for information in the missing girls cases, along with the now-confirmed murder of Susan LaRosa, is producing more results than it ever has in previous years. All of the cases have become like the five points of a star. No matter how I draw it, each point directs me right back to one of the others. And no matter how much I try to rule him out, each point draws a dotted line back to Bob LaRosa. The station wagon he drove that suddenly disappeared. The khaki shirt and pants uniform he always wore. His affinity for young girls. His abusive marriage. I need to shift my focus on him. To learn more about who he was and the life he lived. I can't say for certain he's directly involved in all the missing cases. But I get a sense there are far more nefarious secrets buried deep within his family that will help me find answers. Bob was one of ten children in the La Rosa household. His parents, Nunzio Sr., the father, and Meme, the mother, were said to be unable to control or take care of such a large family. According to relatives, the couple lived in squalor and did not watch their children. Because of this, it was the late 1960s when the state stepped in and separated all ten La Rosa kids, two of them staying locally with a foster family and eight of them sent to orphanages and foster care further away. At some point, Meme La Rosa got the children back. The father, Nunzio Sr., died in December 1970. The La Rosa family inhabited an entire plot of land which held their main house and a camping trailer set up in the backyard. It was on Pine Street, just across the street from Crystal Lake, right on the border of the property belonging to the Wendells, the couple you heard back in Episode 1 who are focused on digging up their water wells. In 1972, all the La Rosa kids, mostly grown at this point, went their separate ways after the entire family moved out of their Crystal Lake home. The reason for their sudden departure? I am almost certain at this point it has something to do with what happened the previous year, 1971, to Bob LaRosa's sister. Previously on Paper Ghosts. He was angry. Like, I always thought it was an accident. And he just hit her. He hit her hard. And my mom just fell. Like, totally just fell. And I kept, Mommy, Mommy, wake up. Mommy, wake up. Mommy, wake up. And my mom wasn't wasn't moving, you know, like there was no twitching, there was, and my mom just didn't move. My dad was bad with me. My dad didn't stop touching me until I was 12. I know my dad liked young girls. What did you see when you went there the first time after she went missing? Describe what you first saw. First time, blood. On the floor, on the wall, on the door, down the stairs. Big pool of it. He gave me a putty knife to clean it up. My name is M. William Phelps. This is Paper Ghosts. Known to everyone as Rini, Irene LaRosa was the eighth LaRosa child to be born. She had long brown hair, feathered and wavy. She was just over five feet tall, 110 pounds, seemingly happy and content. Ellington being a small town, it's no surprise to learn that Anne Prentice, one of Susan LaRosa's sisters, who you heard in the last episode, was best friends with Bob LaRosa's sister Irene while growing up. Irene and I were best buds. We, well, we rode the bus to school, and that was like a half-hour ride, going to school and coming back. You know, we went, we had to travel quite a ways. And she loved singing, and I loved singing, and we used to sing on the bus all the time. <laughs> Just 17 years old, Irene sang at the Crystal Lake Ballroom and around the Tri-Town area at local country and western bars. Everyone said she was very talented, smart as well, with a little naivety, I would guess, rooted in her age. We used to talk about how um, as soon as she was ahead of me in school and she was going to, as soon as graduation hit, she was going to go down to California and get a job and get everything all set up. So as soon as I graduated, I could come back and join her. And what, her, what was her reason for doing this? 
to get away from all of the, the sick because we just couldn't spend it. The two of us used to go crazy with everything that was going on. and the, Nothing ever seemed to get better, you know. You, you would, uh, we just couldn't get out of what was happening because it was happening in our home. Um, she told me how she'd been raped and I told her how I had been. And, uh, so we kind of really connected. Let me stop you for a minute. She told you she was raped by whom? By her brother. Her brother. Um, Nathan? Nunzio. Irene and Bob LaRosa's other brother, Nathan, sometimes went by Nunzio or Junior. She was tired of it and I was tired of it and she was due to graduate like that coming year. When Irene suddenly stopped showing up, Anne kept asking one of the LaRosa brothers where she was. After a week of not seeing her, Anne grew terribly concerned. I was told by um, her brother uh, that she was gone, that she had run away. And in my mind, I just said, because I was only 13, you know? And I'm, I'm going, okay, well, she had enough. She couldn't wait. So she went down, and she's going to send for me. And I just kept waiting for her to send for me, but it never happened. Anne began asking any one of the many La Rosa siblings if they knew where Irene went or if they had heard anything from her. One of Irene's sisters would only say, I miss her. Nothing more. It was as if she wanted to say something else, but was afraid to. Anne then asked Irene's mother, Meme. And I tried talking to her about her, and she just said, yep, she ran away, that's it. Nobody knows anything. So let's get this straight. A 17-year-old child runs away, is missing, or whatever the case may be, and her mother does nothing? Files no police report? Does not contact the newspapers? Does not query around town? Beg anyone and everyone she can for help? And the mom wasn't worried about going to look for her? No. Bob LaRosa, I've been told by some, was the one who looked out for the others in the family. I have a difficult time believing this. Did Bob ever say anything about Rini to you? No. She was never brought up. Ever. It's like she dropped off the face of the earth. <laughs> and if you tried to say anything to them about her, they didn't like that. Here's the thing. I know siblings of missing people. I've interviewed family members of the missing all over this country. I mean, look at Janice Pocket's sister, Lisa White's, Susan LaRosa's, all of whom you've heard in previous episodes. I have never, ever met one sibling of a missing person who was not consumed with the idea of doing anything he or she could to find that person. There seem to be things here within Irene's disappearance that are being kept hidden. Buried secrets beyond the incestuous behavior I need to uncover. So I dig deeper, start asking my law enforcement and La Rosa family contacts questions, and I learn that Irene La Rosa's disappearance was reported by a family member in 2016. 45 years after she was last heard from or seen. Turns out, Irene LaRosa is the missing girl the state police are searching for on the Wendell property across the street from Crystal Lake. Recently at the Wendell's property, the police were acting on a tip that a body was buried in the area. I'm still trying to find out more about that tip. Most importantly, who left it? For now, however, I found the person who filed Irene's missing person report all these years later. Good morning. Good morning. Tina LaRosa is Irene Rini LaRosa's niece, and in 2016, it was Tina who filed the missing person report on her aunt. As luck would have it, I was connected to Tina through Mary Engelbrecht, the sister of Janice Pocket, who you heard in episode one. The two initially met online and sparked up a friendship after bonding through similar tragedies. Since filing the report, Tina has been obsessed with pushing police to look at Irene LaRosa's case. But up until now, she's not heard much from them. Tina is a former hospice worker in her late 40s, living in Massachusetts. She has a presence about her, a determination. She's been on a crusade, very vocal and critical of state police's handling of her aunt's case, all of which she airs on Facebook. I have to be careful with Tina, and I've discussed my concerns with her because she tends to publish certain sensitive information on social media. Part of it is the pain of loss. Part of it, the idea of not knowing. I get it. Not everyone appreciates Tina's way of doing things. But I'm interested in information, not optics. Tina and I met on a humid July day across the street from Crystal Lake, in the area where the La Rosa family lived. This is the only thing that still exists from their house, is that big pine tree right there. The house she's talking about is the former La Rosa property. It's still there, from like the, the bricks from where the foundation sat from the old house. Right here in all these bushes over here is where Nathan's camper would have sat, and it would have sat against the road, so the door would have been facing towards the wood. I have not been able to find any law enforcement paper trail connected to Irene La Rosa's disappearance. I've asked all my sources. Nobody seems to know much about the case. 
when you told the police about this, because you filed a missing person report. Yeah. And what did they tell you when you filed it? They didn't tell me much. They weren't very helpful. Um, Were they interested? No. In 1985, 14 years after Irene LaRosa disappeared, the Hartford Current wrote about it. That article reported that Irene left home when she was 15, returning for short periods of time and then leaving again, and that she was seeing a man named Bob who was a teacher and lived in a nearby town. He was nine years her senior. And then this. Friends told one of her sisters that Irene had a son. Her sister, however, was unable to confirm it. A source who married into the La Rosa family has told me, after Irene went missing, there was talk that she was living 90 minutes south in Fairfield County, Connecticut, and had a son. I have trouble believing this. I had my private investigator look into it. He found nothing. Law enforcement could not verify the information. So you have the, and I'm going to say this kind of rudely, the more intelligent ones saying, oh, she's missing. And then you have kind of the, the ones over here that are saying, she's been, we've seen her, we've heard from her. Irene could still be alive. She was a child, just 17 in 1971. If all I've heard about her being abused by her brother Nathan is true, there was just cause and very good reason for her to leave on her own. The article that I had the other day was about my Aunt Vicky on how she disappeared at the age of 17. And my meme search the, took the search dogs out after her, went to court. You know what I mean? She was 17 years old and my meme went hell and furious on her. It was in 1966, and one of Irene's older sisters, Vicky, also went missing. Their mother, Meme, sent out the troops when Vicky vanished, reaching out to reporters and not stopping until Vicky was found not long after. Apparently, she tried to skip town because of some trouble she'd gotten into. But when Rini a couple years later goes, nothing? According to Tina, there were no reporters, no search parties, no one concerned about Irene's disappearance. It was as if Irene never existed in the first place. This past year has shown us that without your health, you have nothing. If you're not well, you can't work, look after yourself, or take care of your family. You can't enjoy the life you worked so hard to build. That's why you need to prioritize taking care of your long-term health today, before it goes from good to bad to worse. So invest in your long-term health with Forward. Forward is intelligent medicine with a personal touch. Their doctors are dedicated to catching top killers like cancer and heart disease early, before it's too late. And catching them early could save you tens of thousands of dollars in the long run. Everyone's health history is different, which is why Forward doctors personalize a health plan with you based on your genetics, lifestyle, and biometrics to achieve long-term results and ensure nothing gets missed. It's time to invest in a doctor that's invested in you. Go to GoForward.com today to protect your future health. That's GoForward.com. GoForward.com. This past year has shown us that without your health, you have nothing. If you're not well, you can't work, look after yourself, or take care of your family. You can't enjoy the life you worked so hard to build. That's why you need to prioritize taking care of your long-term health today before it goes from good to bad to worse. So invest in your long-term health with Forward. Forward is intelligent medicine with a personal touch. Their doctors are dedicated to catching top killers like cancer and heart disease early, before it's too late. And catching them early could save you tens of thousands of dollars in the long run. Everyone's health history is different, which is why Forward doctors personalize a health plan with you based on your genetics, lifestyle, and biometrics to achieve long-term results and ensure nothing gets missed. It's time to invest in a doctor that's invested in you. Go to GoForward.com today to protect your future health. That's GoForward.com. GoForward.com. Irene LaRosa's brother, Rudy LaRosa, was there, in the thick of it all, when Irene went missing in 1971. Rudy is direct, sharp-witted, and strikes me as a guy who does not like to speculate or bullshit. It either is or it isn't. I immediately relate to Rudy in this regard. In recent years, when his daughter Tina began her own investigation into her aunt's disappearance, Rudy stepped up and, however begrudgingly, decided to answer Tina's tough questions about the LaRosa family history. The good, the bad, and the very ugly. Rudy? Thank you, Rudy, for coming. Nice to meet you, man. After several requests, Rudy finally agreed to meet with me over the summer. As I take out a map of Crystal Lake, I notice he looks an awful lot like his brothers Bob and Nathan. Just a bit older and grayer, with less hair. He has that pudgy, familiar La Rosa face. I says, this is about where our house was. The well was over here, because we used to build a fort. We burnt it down a couple, three times or so. We were kids. We put a fire in there too close to the wall. I've heard from a few sources there was a fort, or in one case, a bunker, brothers Bob and Nathan LaRosa built. Something underground and hidden, very private, very isolated, accessible by only those who knew it was there. Now, working in true crime, when we hear the word bunker, as you might be thinking right now, we assume dark, evil activity. 
usually involving sick, sadistic sexual crimes committed against women. So I listen as Rudy explains exactly where the bunker was and begin to understand a few things I have been vague on up to this point. Just the cement is there, and there's a cutoff in the cement where they're, because you just open the door and step in or whatever. Because we used to go in that way and crawl to the, to the back corner, hatching the floor that we built, and that's how we got into the fort. The only way in, the only way out. Rudy was closest to Bob and Irene. And Irene, he tells me, was their mother, Meme's, slave child. My mother had her thumb on her. She couldn't move, and my mother was, do this, do that, do this, do that. As we chat about Meme and Irene, I begin to understand something important in Irene's case. The La Rosa home sat on a rise, a big bay window in the small dining area overlooking Crystal Lake. In front of that window was a table and chair, where an unkempt and severely obese Meme would sit and direct the household. According to Rudy, Meme squawked and screamed at the children and rarely left that chair. She seemed to have an affinity to Nathan and his needs. Think of the Cinderella story minus the stepsisters, but with all the wickedness attached. Meme had chosen Irene as her Cinderella for some reason. I get the impression Meme despised her, even hated her. So in 71, I mean, does Rini go walk out the door and not come back or what happens? She always said when she turned 18, she was going to leave. When she said that, was it kind of like, I'm chasing my dream or I'm getting the fuck out of here? I'm um, probably getting the fuck out of here. Okay. We all did. When we all got old enough to get out, I, my mother signed me in the military to get me into the Marine Corps. She used my father's social security number. I'm a DD-214. His number is there, crossed off physically, and mine put on top of it. So your mom was... She was a, big and fat and used whatever she could from people. That's the way she was, that I recall. Mean? 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old kid, yeah, she was mean as hell to me. What about Tarini? Yeah, she had her doing everything. She was, you know, had her back in call, basically. What did you, th what, what did you think at the time about Rini, where she just took off? She did what she said she was going to do. 18, she's free. You think she's still alive? I'm hoping. I have no idea. I have to remind myself, as I get into this with Rudy, that all of the La Rosa kids were, at one time, sent away into foster care and orphanages. We used to live in the same orphanage until I was like 11 years old, or just before that. And how come? Because uh, your parents could know. You don't know. To my knowledge, when I got out of the hospital, I went to my first foster home, straight out of the hospital. That's what I'm told. I didn't know that back then and stuff. I got a lot of vague memories and stuff. But I went from foster home, foster home. I think it was three different ones until I ended up in the orphanage. And I only remember being on the stairs with my two sisters and we were all crying. I'm told that they were not put into foster care or orphanages that the state actually took them out of the home because Meme could not care for them. How did you end up back at home? I don't know. Wow. I don't know. There was child abuse going on in the orphanage that I know of. I know for a fact. Was, was Bob in the same orphanage? No. <clears throat> Bob went, ended up in Deep River with Junior. Ah. Uh, Deep River is a solid hour's drive south of the Ellington area. Bob and Nathan being in the same orphanage, though, it means something to me when I look at the situation from a psychological perspective. There is no doubt they, too, were abused. Rudy stopped just short of confirming the unthinkable by not wanting to get into it. I've heard this from many different reputable sources. And the orphanage they were sent was known to be an extremely abusive institution. This is the 60s, mind you. Just recently, another story came to light about Bob LaRosa owning an ambulance. It was one of those creepy types, more like a bloated station wagon, exactly like the Ghostbusters Echo One from the 1984 film with the pointy, fin-like back fenders. The story alleged that Bob and Nathan, in those days before Bob married Susan, supposedly soundproofed the inside, back end of the vehicle, so they could allegedly pick up girls and violate them without being heard. That insulated van or whatever that everybody says that my brother Bob had and stuff was an old 50 Pontiac ambulance. We tore that place down. The only interior that was done was what was done as it was for an ambulance. He did nothing to the thing. He drove it to the dirt. Did he drive around town in it? Yeah. Before our interview... I've been hearing about some seriously dark behaviors among Bob, Nathan, and Irene. If anyone could confirm this, it would be Rudy. Well, do you think there was anything weird between uh, Rini and Nathan or Rini and Bob? Rini and Nathan, there might have been. Yeah. I wouldn't include Bob at all because he was off with his buddies and whatever. Rudy could not recall with any certainty what Bob was doing at the time, mainly because they rarely saw each other. Rudy had once pummeled Bob over a dispute. They were teens. Bob, however, realized Rudy was tougher and was not going to take any shit so he stayed away after that. Nathan, on the other hand, didn't. Rudy tells me about a time when he was with his wife and Nathan one day. But I remember I, I got out for something 
we stopped at a car wash because his car was filthy from sitting under the tree. He hadn't had it that long. And I don't remember, there was some conversation that he was talking to my wife. And I'm sure he was putting a move because she said that he made a pass like that. He wanted to run me over or something like that. He would do that for her if he wanted it and stuff. Wow. So he was um, a little nuts in the head. Did, was, was he creepy? He was always creepy. <laughs> my mother sicked him on me one time because I wouldn't do what she wanted and I beat him up. And then she sicked my brother Bob on me one time and I beat him up. But I was, you know, 13, 14 years old. If my sister was to have gotten hurt, which I don't know one way or another, hopefully it didn't happen that way, but if anybody was to have done something, I'd have blamed Junior before I'd have blamed Bob. By Junior, Rudy is referring to Nathan. Summer is finally here. Which activities do you want to spend the most time doing these months? You've waited so long, right? Well, maybe you want to spend some time with friends at a backyard barbecue. Maybe you want to go to the pool or the beach. Or just maybe you want to devote more time to playing Best Fiends, the five-star rated puzzle game packed with super fun brain challenges and never-ending entertainment. There's always new characters to collect or a new level to defeat and another new level to defeat and another level after that. No, really. Best Fiends has over 5,000 levels to keep you challenged. The game starts off pretty easy, but soon enough, you'll be addicted to beating the tougher levels. That's enough gameplay to keep you busy from this summer till who knows. So make Best Fiends one of your summer activities. It's always fun, never frustrating, and keeps you coming back for more. Download Best Fiends on the App Store or Google Play for free today. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Hey, yo, this is Face Mob. It's Willie D. Here to share some new information about our new podcast, Ghetto Boys. Reload it. Make sure that you tune in to our debut on Monday, July 5th. We're going to bring you episodes featuring some of the most iconic figures in hip-hop. And you don't want to miss it. Listen to the Ghetto Boys Reloaded podcast starting Monday, July 5th on the Black Effect Podcast Network, our Heart Radio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. In a quarter of a mile, the destination is on your right. The answers in Irene Rini LaRosa's disappearance and perhaps some of the other cases I'm looking into seem tied in some way to the LaRosa family history. All right. I'm back paying a visit to Tina LaRosa, the niece of Irene LaRosa who filed the missing persons report. Hi. Inside her raised ranch style home, Tina's dining room table has become her office. Papers and notes about all the cases spread about. Nice place you got here, out here. Oh, thank you. Tina, like some of the relatives of the missing girls, has turned herself into an armchair investigator. As we chat, a name so familiar to me comes up. Lisa White, there's a quite a few people that kind of connect her, saying that he was kind of obsessed with Lisa White, Nathan was. They lived on, um, before they moved to Pine Street in Ellington, they lived on uh, Regan Road over in Vernon. Um, and so did Lisa White. She lived a couple houses down from them. Lisa White is the 13-year-old girl who went missing as she presumably hitchhiked home after visiting a friend's house in 1974. She lived on Reagan Road, true. But the fact that Nathan LaRosa also lived on Reagan Road at the time is a connection too important to ignore. Nathan was always known to be kind of at the back of the house, kind of staring at the kids, playing, Lisa being one of them. Um, my Aunt Debbie gives a report of Lisa coming to the house when her dog got hit by a car. Her dog got hit, Lisa came to the house, said, you know, here's your dog. Tina claims Nathan had a thing for Lisa, and it kicked into high gear after Lisa brought the dog over to the house. Well, since then, Nathan was, like, obsessed with her, would always watch her. Nathan grew into an obese man. He rarely showered or cleaned himself. A convicted pedophile, Nathan did hard time from 1976 to 1979 for child rape. In 1980, Nathan moved to Florida to live with his parents. He came back to the Tritown area in 1995 and moved in with his brother, Bob LaRosa, and died three years later while living in an elderly home. When I first met Tina, I knew she'd have a lot of information regarding unanswered questions within the LaRosa family tragedies. I just didn't realize how much she knew. For years, Tina's talked to family members, reached out to acquaintances, went online and started a shitstorm of social media about her Aunt Irene's disappearance. After sharing her plans to file a missing person report in a Facebook post in 2017, the year before Bob died, she got a message from Bob LaRosa's Facebook account. Well, I can start by this one. This is um, August 11, 2015. I was one of the per people that filed an uh, official police report. Those comments saying none were filed were woefully incorrect. Listening to you read those texts, I wouldn't say Bob was stupid. He uses words in there that... Um, I wouldn't say this is Bob. Uh, I was... see Bob's picture. You can see Bob's picture in here. I was thinking the same thing. This is not Bob. 
You know why? Because we're all a little dyslexic, Delora says. So Bob, or as Tina suspects, someone else who was writing the message for Bob was still trying to deflect attention away from Irene's disappearance, decades after she allegedly vanished. I have to wonder, why? What's more, I've searched hell and high water. Bob LaRosa never filed a missing person report on his sister. That is a fact. Tina's always been aware of her family's dark horses and hidden secrets, but things took a serious turn in recent years when she started connecting them to her Aunt Irene's disappearance. There she was, stealthily connecting the dots, and ultimately, zeroing in on a family friend who, after almost 50 years, has decided to inject himself into these cases and start talking. Tina brings up a difficult story she learned from someone close to this person, one that also involves her uncle, Bob LaRosa. She says to me, well, Bobby was a dangerous man, that when they were younger, they, for just ha-has, they found a girl and picked her up. She was walking down the side of the road. They stuck a light bulb up her rear end and propped her on the sidewalk. Tina called the state police and told them about this incident. She also spoke to several family members who verified the story. A newspaper report backs up certain details, including the abduction and the girl being left on the side of the road. She was brutally wounded and ultimately died from her injuries, turning the assault into a murder case. I'm not going to mention the other man's name yet because I'm in the process of reaching out to him. He deserves that privacy. For now, I'll be referring to him as The Witness. Bob LaRosa and The Witness were best friends. They'd known each other since grade school. At one time, they were even brothers-in-law. Tina tells me she decided to make contact with The Witness in 2018, years after filing the missing person report and becoming frustrated nothing was being done. So I decided to call him and play the little dan Danzel in distress and, you know, my aunt and I miss her and I, you know, I can't believe that nobody cares and, oh, I loved your aunt. Greeny was wonderful. I dated her for a time. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, her and Nathan had this weird thing and I think Nathan was hurting her and I was like, okay. But so we had gotten talking and I was asking about um, Nathan and Bob hurting her um, and if they did, where would they put her hypothetically? Tina's spoken to the witness on four different occasions. Those first few calls, they talked a lot about Irene LaRosa, who she was, and the relationship between them. Then there came a point, as she was talking to the witness, when Tina realized he had vital information. There was enough said to lead her to believe he wasn't just an innocent bystander to some of this. Tina says the witness believes Nathan killed his own sister, Irene LaRosa. Keep this in mind, though. Nathan went to prison for sexually abusing boys. Still, that does not make it impossible for him to develop an affinity for females, especially when talking about that ugly word, incest. Psychologically speaking, there is more at play with that scenario. Control, power, rage, jealousy. Gender would not matter. According to Tina, the witness began talking about the water wells across the street from Crystal Lake. He mentioned buried bodies. When she heard that, Tina called the state police and asked them to get involved. This explains why her last call with the witness was controlled, meaning law enforcement sat by Tina's side and recorded it. It was this call that tipped cops off in 2019 to begin that latest dig at the water wells on the Wendell's property. So that was enough for me. Just somebody do something. Get over here. I want him to tell you guys what he told me. What happened? Told you where what? Where they would have been, the girls would have been. If, hypothetically, if Nathan hurt them and put them somewhere, where would they be? And he said, well, our fort was right here. That's girls. Plural. According to the witness, Irene LaRosa and several of the other missing girls are buried in an area across from Crystal Lake, somewhere on or nearby the old LaRosa property. Hello. Hello. Mo LaRosa walks in as Tina and I are talking. Remember Mo? He's Bob and Susan LaRosa's youngest son. He and Tina are cousins. As he takes a seat across the dining table from me, Tina says something about a well on the Wendell's property. Sorry, I'm just explaining to him about the first time we talked. But then when I put him on recording with the cops, he then said, no, it's the A-framed well up here. The witness had mentioned an A-frame green-colored roof during his last call with Tina. On the Wendell property, there are over a dozen water wells scattered about 46 acres. One of them is a 15-foot deep, 8 by 8 foot well, think Jack and Jill type, with an A-framed green-colored roof covering it. This is across the road from where the state police once dug. So claim that the girls were put in the A-framed well. Yes, he explained how to take a bar, open up the well, and then slide it back. And we have that on recording. When Ken Wendell was tipped off by the cops many years ago, he actually sent an underwater camera down that A-frame well. He searched the entire thing, 
and found nothing. What worries me after spending 20 years in the true crime game is that if a person of interest is talking about Wells, a crime scene, bodies being buried, as the witness has apparently been doing, my instinct and experience tell me these clues are a diversion, that there are no bodies in Wells. The bodies are somewhere else and the witness is throwing off the scent. Yet, why the hell would he involve himself all these years later to begin with? But back to the, the Wells where, we, where we've been to that property and we did a memorial there on a tree. As it turns out, Mo and Tina are responsible for that mystery flower memorial that Ken Wendell mentioned seeing during one of my last visits to the property. It's the same spot where they believe their Aunt Irene LaRosa and some of the other girls could be buried, according to what the witness has been saying. So I find it, you know what I mean, very hard to believe they had never done anything to her, and yet one couldn't have known where she was why the other one didn't. All this information from Tina and Mo leads me directly into the center of that five-point star. Getting to this point in my investigation isn't as easy as it sounds. It has been a long and emotionally exhausting 11-year journey. I've run into dozens of false leads and dead ends. All the suspects frequently named online and the ones I've developed on my own have been eliminated for a variety of reasons. Many of them police have checked out, questioned, and let go of. It wasn't until the witness began talking to Tina, on top of all I've learned over the past year, that the pieces of this disturbing puzzle I've been collecting finally seem to fit. I'm not 100% confident Bob and Nathan LaRosa are connected to all the cases. But there's enough for me to continue looking into that possibility. The witness is the only one of the three men I am now focused on who is still alive. I want to reach out to him. But it has to be under my terms. In the next episode of Paper Ghosts, let me just tell you, there's a, piece of, there's a tarp behind him. It's a plastic tarp. And they thought that was interesting? The yeah, tarp? Oh yeah, they yeah. held it up and they, were, the they all, they all came over and had to look at it. and then... Had stained, a lot of brown stains on it. They mm -hmm. were wondering if it was blood or something on there. But... He went home to take a shower. I always get her stuff ready. And he'd come out completely naked and said, you want to have a good time? Come on in the bedroom. And how old were you at the time? 13. He got really mad at me one time. And he said, if you don't watch it, you're going to end up like your sister. Jesus, Mary and Josephine, I hope that's not a grave for many. Oh, you know what? I think it is. Paper Ghosts is written and executive produced by me, M. William Phelps, with help from producer Christina Everett and sound editing by Pete Cardi from Backroom Audio. A special thanks to Abu Safar and Will Pearson from iHeartRadio. The series theme, number 442, is written and performed by Tom Mooney and Thomas Phelps. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. A young college grad gunned down walking his dog. A young mom, Michelle Parker, vanishes after dropping off her little twins at the babysitter. Nancy Grace here. Every day on Crime Stories, we break down the biggest breaking crime news and study the clues left behind so we can help crime victims and their families. Every day, a mission. Every day, another chance to stop crime and keep one more person safe. Join us. Listen to Crime Stories with Nancy Grace on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Power in the 21st century. Who has it? How are they using it? And how is it impacting our lives? This is the Recount Daily Pod, where we'll explore the intersection of power, business, technology, culture, and yes, politics too. I'm Rena Nainan. I'm a host of the Recount Daily Pod. I've spent decades covering politics and foreign affairs as a White House reporter and Middle East correspondent, traveling everywhere from Baton Rouge to Benghazi. Each morning on the Recount Daily Pod, I'll bring you a quick rundown of the top headlines and then an in-depth interview with decision makers, the reporters covering them, and experts who break it all down. Who's actually controlling the narrative and how is it shifting? We'll connect the dots, helping you reframe and rethink the issues that matter. Listen to the Recount Daily Pod starting on Tuesday, July 6th on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.